afternoon. I am Virginia Brissett, the president and CEO of the Jewish Council located in Gainesville, the heart of North Central Florida. It is my pleasure to represent the Southern Alliance for Jewish Education in welcoming you to From Sepharad to Savannah and Beyond, Southern Jewish Cooking and Culture with Sarah Gardner. The Southern Alliance for Jewish Education, or SAGE as we call it, is an informal collective of Jewish uh, congregations and other organizations who network to share program ideas and opportunities. This Jewish Culture and Cooking series is the third webinar that we have hosted together as a group in 2021. For today's final class, we're going to explore the modern day revival now happening and redefining Jewish soul food in America. We have been absolutely blown away by the response to this series. Thank you to all those folks who tuned in through all three of these sessions. If you missed one or both of the previous classes, as we just said, no worries. We will have the recordings of them available to you later this week, and we will notify the list when you can see them on YouTube. Before I thank our program sponsors, I want to take a moment to welcome and acknowledge another member of our SAGE Steering Committee, who is our hostess for today, Margaret Norman, from Temple Bethel in Birmingham, Alabama. If you've appreciated this learning opportunity hosted by SAGE, please consider making a donation to any of the organizations who made today possible, and they are the Jewish Council in Gainesville, Florida, Temple Bethel and Temple Emmanuel in Birmingham, Alabama, Temple Israel in Brookline, Massachusetts, Temple of Israel in Wilmington, North Carolina, and the Tommaso family of Augusta, Georgia. I will now turn things over to Margaret Norman, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. I'm so thrilled to be here today. Um, Temple Bethel has really enjoyed collaborating with SAGE on this series and, and looks forward to future collaborations also. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Sarah today, um, our wonderful teacher. So Sarah Gardner is a second year PhD student in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese Studies at the University of Minnesota. Her work focuses on the culinary heritage and cultural identity of the Sephardic Jews. Before coming to UMN, she worked as the collaborations manager for the Jewish Arts Collaborative and the associate director for young adult programs at Hebrew College in Boston, Massachusetts. She's an alumna of Tufts University and from 2016 to 2017, Sarah lived and researched medieval Sephardic culinary heritage in Spain as a Fulbright graduate research scholar. She's presented her work at various international food studies conferences, including the Oxford Symposium on Food and Cookery, and the Dublin Gastronomy Symposium. Sarah is also a published cookbook author. You can buy her cookbook, the Rosh Hashanah Seder Cookbook, Stories and Recipes from the Reformed Jewish Community of Madrid on Amazon. We are so lucky to have Sarah here today. Um, and with that, I am going to turn it over to her for our workshop. Thank you so much, Margaret, for this, that awesome introduction. And thank you to Virginia and to Sage for having me. This has been such an awesome series and I'm so glad that we were able to put it together and it's just been a joy being here and I can't believe it's class number three so I, it's, I feel like the weeks have flown by so I'm delighted to see the folks for whom it's your first class welcome I'm so glad you're here for folks who it's your second and third thank you so much for coming back and being here and and closing out this series with me it's been a really fun um, ride together so um, today we're gonna start with history I know last class we started with cooking and then we did the history today we're going to do the history and then we're going to finish up with the cooking so um, we're, we're changing the order a little bit but I thought that would be a really nice way to kind of get us into the mood so I'm going to share my screen um, I also just wanted to say I loved that question um, that Camille asked in the chat um, about um, African Jewish recipes Camille I think it was um, and luckily we're going to be covering that a little bit today. So hopefully that will feel exciting for you. Um, and yeah, so I just wanted to say that, but okay, let's get, let's get started. So as always, I think it's helpful, especially for the folks who haven't been with us and for the folks who have, right, to just kind of like recap a little bit um, what we've covered. So our first class, right, we, we, dove into the Sephardic history of the South. We talked about the chef dolls who are German Jews, but also came with a group of Portuguese Jewish colonial settlers to the South, um, to Georgia specifically, and, and their kind of lasting influence and, and 
also the, the culinary heritage around them, right? Um, and then that kind of, that covered like the colonial period for us, right? And then we kind of went a little bit further by talking about the Ashkenazi heritage um, of especially the Delta region, especially Mississippi. And if you remember this fabulous photo, which I love, um, of a, a gathering at the B'nai B'rith Literary Association in Vicksburg, Mississippi, um, you know, talking about the different ways that Ashkenazi Jews especially were involved in the food culture in the South and, and how that heritage kind of built up um, a presence. But that also, it was, you know, a, a Jewish experience, both culinary and otherwise, that had some tensions to it, right? This kind of simultaneously push and pull of assimilating, but also wanting to preserve a very strong kind of sense of Jewish identity. We talked about um, some of the heritage um, between German Jews and Eastern European Jews and how some of those tensions played out um, socially, culturally, in food as well. And so that kind of brought us up through, you know, the late 19th, early 20th century, if we're kind of thinking about timing. Um, and today we're going to continue the conversation by talking about um, Jewish soul food. And, and the way I kind of, you know, we have our little description, but the way I kind of thought about this um, was it would kind of bring us through what's happening now in terms of um, Jewish food in the South, okay? So, um, but before that, I also want to recap, um, again, right, we've been using these categories to kind of help us think about Southern food and Jewish food and Southern Jewish food, right, you know, that have sort of specific contours. It's not just flavor, it's not just taste, it's also region, it's history, it's culture, right? It's all of these kind of different things that help us understand what a food culture is, not just by what it's not, but, but what it actually is in a constructive way, right? So just to refresh, um, right, we have these kind of three categories that I've offered to think about Southern food, right? We've got our region that, you know, brings with us a, a certain climate, certain ingredients, that kind of thing. History, the settlement of the South, you know, the different peoples who kind of lived here, came here, left their food traditions here, and how how is that kind of integrated into um, what we now know as Southern food? Um, and then culture, right? Like what makes the South culturally different? Like a whole number of things, you know, maybe it's a different, um, different than the North and that's just the answer for culture. Or maybe it's that it's these different people who have left their culinary mark or it's a different response to a different set of circumstances, right? Um, and that all informs how we think about um, Southern food. And then thinking about Jewish food, right? We, we did that exercise where I asked you, you know, what, what, when you think of Jewish food, what do you think about, right? Because really when we're thinking about Jewish food again, we're thinking about this really vibrant, diverse tapestry of a lot of peoples throughout many different um, periods of time and many different places um, who are all simultaneously connected by this, this religious identity, right? This thread of, of being Jewish. Um, you know, so what does that mean generally for identity, but also what does that mean in terms of food? Well, so I, you know, offered these three categories, right? Um, diaspora, right? When we're talking about Jews, we're talking about this big dispersion of people through time and place. That's how in, in the South we can have German Jews, Eastern European Jews, Sephardic Jews, right? Or, and, and new Jews as we'll kind of explore today, which is um, kind of fun, I think. And um, we have religious observance, right? Like we have a huge textual tradition that has given us different food items that are important, like matzah, for example, like eating unleavened bread on Passover, holiday observance, all of these things that are very kind of fundamentally part of Jewish identity that are enacted through food that comes specifically from our religious tradition. But then at the same time, we have kashrut, right? Which is a very kind of interpretive, flexible thing. And we kind of saw that last class, right? When we're talking about, okay, there's this group of Jews who are settling in the South and yet there's no kosher butcher. So what do you do? Like, how do you gastronomically enact your Jewishness, right? And then finally, that question, which we're going to kind of play with, especially today, of like ethnic and cultural 
uh, ties with, with Jewish food of like, you know, when we're talking about Jews, are they, are they assimilating? Are they considered by the majority culture uh, a part of that majority culture or are they different? And is that marked and how and why? And how can we see that through the food, right? So those are just our few little, like, just to kind of get us thinking again, um, it, putting on our, our hats of Southern Jewish food. Um, but today, you know, I wanna ask you guys actually, and I'd love it if you could put it in the chat, this question, what is Jewish soul food? So you can, you can say, you can answer that question just as is, what is Jewish soul food? Or you can like answer the question of like, what do you think Jewish soul food means? Um, or, you know, what does it look like? What does it taste like? What is soul food to you? I'm curious. So feel free to put it in the chat. I'd love to see some answers and we can start our conversation from there. Okay, I see chicken soup, okay. Yeah, like what's soul food and what's Jewish soul food? Like, are they different? Are they the same? How does that work? Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of good stuff. Ancestral recipes of soul food emphasizes both comfort and identity. Just guessing, combination of Jewish and African American slash Jamaican American traditions. Cholent, oh, I like this Judith food that speaks to the Jewish soul. <laughs> it's about whatever my Bubby made. <laughs> I love that. Comfort food. I think of the Ethiopians who were rescued. Food that I feel is comfort food. Food that my grandmother cooked. Noodle kogel, matzo balls, gefilte fish, brisket and latkes. Yeah, we got some good Ashkenazi soul food there. <laughs> yeah, Adina Ashkenazi food, great. Yeah, I love this. This is great. So yeah, here. So here's here's some stuff that's coming up. I think um, right. Comfort is a big thing with soul food. It's the food that makes you feel most like held in your identity, right? And and often it's fatty and heavy and and warming and and just you know feels good. It's not about <laughs> it's not about nutrition. It's not about cutting calories. Um, and I like that, Lenore. Okay, um, soul food connotes collard greens and typical Southern vegetables, right? So, okay, so now we we are also bringing in this idea of soul food, right? That's kind of specifically connected to the African American diaspora and the African American presence in the United States. Good, yeah. So we've got layers, right? So it's comforting food. It's food that is maybe specifically connected to like a specific type of Jewish identity. In this case, I'm seeing a lot of Ashkenazi examples here, which I love, you know, the chicken soup, brisket, latkes. And also soul food has that kind of deep connotation with um, the African-American community, right? Food specific to holidays, special foods. Yes, I love this. This is all great. I love everything I'm seeing here. Perfect. So, um, I'm going to explore today, um, a few of my own answers to this question, actually, because I have, when I think about Jewish soul food, I actually think about many different kind of communities who are involved, um, in answering that question. Um, and I think it's really important that we kind of bring in all of those communities as we kind of have in the chat, but as we're talking about what it is, um, because they're all really important. In the answer. So, um, and one of the ways that I think it's really important to talk about this is to talk about the kind of um, interesting and complicated and long-standing relationship between the Southern Jewish community um, and the African American community in the South. So um, I would actually love if somebody could read this quotation for me out loud. Um, anybody feel feel brave today? <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> yes, please. Okay, from Matzabal Gumba, Culinary Tales of the Jewish South. Jews briz the cag chasm between Delta white and black cultures in their role of merchants, cotton brokers, and music agents. 
a compelling source of Jewish identity in the Delta was associated with food served at the dinner table in the synagogue kitchen and in Jewish owned grocery stores and dry goods stores. Jews encountered their white and black Gentile neighbors, customers, domestic workers, cooks and caterers, Southern and Jewish foods mix at times emphasize Jewish Southerners and at other times it emphasized their Jewishness. Beautiful. Thank you. I love that. Yeah. So I think, you know, what really speaks to me about this quotation um, is that, you know, all throughout this series together, we've been talking about, um, you know, the phases of Jewish settlement, right? But Jews are not a community that exist in a vacuum, especially not in the South, right? And, and I think there's this constant kind of intercultural communication and sharing that's happening between the Jewish community and as it settles, like including its own kind of internal diversity and the African-American community who at different moments, you know, was enslaved, was free, was domestic were the domestic workers of Jewish families right so we've got this very kind of long-standing relationship that I think here feels very important as we're trying to define that Jewish soul food question okay and a lot of it right comes out as uh Marcy Cohen Ferris is telling us through food which I think is very key here um and so I'm going to ask actually someone to read this second quote um from her uh, a new voice if you would I'll be happy to do it. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. And yes. not, okay, I'm ready. And not just then, but also now. Jews accepted African American women as their cooks, first as slaves and later as cooks and caterers. And their presence in homes and synagogue kitchens profoundly shaped Jewish life in communities along the lower Mississippi. Their creolized cuisine bears witness to slavery and to a long history of African-American accommodation and cultural resistance. Recipes passed orally between black cooks and white mistresses, between Jewish mothers and daughters, and between synagogue sisterhood presidents. Beautiful, thank you so much. Um, Right. So again, we're seeing it's this kind of long-standing history, this long-standing complicated question, right, of Jews in the South existing alongside African Americans in a very kind of complex hierarchy of race and sociocultural level, right? So, and a lot of that we're seeing is of this complicated dance is enacted through food. And I think that's a really interesting kind of knot here that is important. And that in the research that I've been doing for this class, I don't often see kind of so explicitly stated, right? Like I think uh, there's a tendency in a lot of history to kind of treat different communities in a silo, right? It's like what's going on with them is what's going on with them. And that's that's their story. But here, especially in the South, and especially when we're talking about Southern Jewish food, um, there's this really deep cultural, racial navigation that's happening that happens through food, happens around food, um, and shapes what we can understand as Southern Jewish food. So um, with that, I want to dive into the history actually a little bit. Um, you know, I think, right, let's start with this narrative, right? What do we do on Passover? We retell the story of our own enslavement in Egypt, right? It's a, a sort of major aspect of that narrative. Um, and one of the things that isn't always mentioned, right, is that a lot of Jews, including Sephardic Jews, some of the Sephardic Jews who settled in the South were themselves slave owners, right? Um, and so I think it's an interesting question to think about um, when we're thinking about like a Sephardic Jewish family in the colonial period, um, not only in the American South, but also in South America, um, crypto Jews as well, who then reconverted to Judaism, um, who are reciting those kind of really powerful words, right, that we say on Passover of, you know, 
next year, may we be free next year um, in Israel while, you know, being served by potentially enslaved peoples. I think the main narrative um, when we talk about um, the Jewish and African-American interaction, especially in the South, is one of, oh, Jews were different, and they are, which we'll kind of cover um, a little later. But I think it's really important here to think about, okay, Jews were considered in this racial hierarchy often as white people, but not quite white people, right? And it puts them in a very kind of strange position relative to the African-American community. It was a part of like assimilation as well, right? As we're talking about um, moving into the 20th century post Jim Crow, right? From last class, we talked about um, the, the prevalence of Jewish peddlers and dry goods stores. We see Ashkenazi and Eastern European Jews actually hire um, more uh, African Americans um, for their dry goods stores um, and employ them gainfully, which and actually in some of the some of Marcy Cohen Ferris's writing, she says she writes that um, or really rather quotes um, African Americans who said that you know the Jews of the South who they engaged with were white, but they weren't quite um, white in the same way of the. Christian majority in the South. And I think that comes out in very interesting ways um, through food. But I think at least the way I was taught it in my growing up experience, I was taught the narrative that Jews were fundamentally part of the civil rights movement, which they were, and we're gonna talk about that actually a little later. Um, but I think there are some complications, and especially when we're talking about um, who is actually doing the domestic work and who is actually doing the food work in some cases in the South, um, who is actually making that Jewish soul food. In a lot of cases, it was African-American women um, in Jewish kitchens um, for Jewish people. I think this also brings up a really interesting part of assimilation as well, which we had covered last class of, you know, you're trying to be Jewish in a place that demographically you're spread out. You're trying to enact your Jewish identity through food, specifically through kosher food, but there's no kosher butcher, right? Like how do you kind of navigate this complex stance of, I want to be Jewish, but I don't necessarily have the resources at my disposal. Um, and there are sacrifices, right, of, of this assimilation. And you see this similarly, I think, with, um, African-American women in Jewish homes who are non-Jewish cooks cooking Jewish food. And I, that's a, there's a really kind of real um, culinary effect um, and a culinary expression of assimilation there. So um, not all of them, or, or I'm sorry, I'm skipping over a point. Um, to that point of assimilation also. So we see kind of culinary signifiers of these women kind of through, through the food that they make. Corn, melon, the prevalence of peanuts. We see um, things in Jewish kitchens like dandelion wine, which were strongly associated with um, the culinary heritage of enslaved people um, and free black people as well. Um, but the, a kitchen that kind of uses the scraps, which is very kind of similar, right, to the Jewish kitchen that we've been talking about um, in past classes, right? It feels very similar to that Eastern European Jewish culinary tradition, but, you know, with different ingredients, things like collards, right? And that's how we start to see these things come into the Jewish repertoire, and we see them in things like sister, like synagogue sisterhood cookbooks, right? Um, so it's an interesting way of, like, bringing someone into your home and having them become this really indelible part of your Jewish culinary expression is, is through this domestic work. Um, but in this question, right, of, of Jews assimilating into the South, I, you know, I don't think we can uh, lie about it. It wasn't all rosy. Um, for those of you who know the history, there's a lot of positive assimilation that happens, especially throughout the 20th century. Um, but then there are some really negative 
uh, experiences, including um, this case called the Leo Frank case, which happened in Atlanta, Georgia in 1913. Um, that has to do with this ethnic and racial identity of Jews and Jews specifically in the South. Um, essentially, what happened in this case is that Leo Frank, who was a manager at a pencil factory um, in Atlanta, uh, was convicted of murdering a 13 year old uh, girl who worked in the factory. Um, and regardless of whether that was true, there's still some you know, question marks around the case. Um, ultimately, he was lynched by a mob of white men who later um, formed uh, the Ku Klux Klan. So, right, like I think in this racial and sociocultural hierarchy, right, the Jews occupy this kind of strange and not always safe place. But at the same time, are people who have hired black domestic workers are people who you know whose ancestors may have actually owned slaves right and so i think we can't talk about jewish soul food and we can't talk about the jewish south i think without talking about this really complicated dance of racial and ethnic identity between jews and african americans so um with that all of these kinds of Things like land, different foods like cup custards, collards, gumbo, barbecue brisket, oh, kosher gumbo, excuse me, it's gumbo without, without shrimp, without um, andouille sausage made from pork, um, grits onto Jewish tables, even as, you know, there's this real desire to maintain a strong sense of Jewish identity. Okay, so that's sort of one aspect. I think also another aspect of soul food, right, is soul food as a distinctively distinctively culinary marker of Black identity, especially during the civil rights movement, right? We're kind of moving through the 20th century. And actually the first time the term soul food is seen in print is in 1964, aligning with the civil rights movement and aligning with um, positive expressions of Black identity and this need to, oh, I'm see, can, can you guys hear me? Is my audio okay? Yeah, we can hear you. You're cutting in and out just a tiny bit, um, yeah, but but uh, I, I think that it's not. It's uh, not too bad. Best, okay. probably. We'll let you know though, if it gets worse. Great, Great. thank you. Yes, okay, so soul food as this thing, right? This really comforting food, but it's also a way to kind of um, bolster Black identity, right? It's not just about nourishing yourself. It's not just about eating enough food to survive. It's also like taking pleasure in food, which often um, was denied to African-American folks in the South. And so um, this marker of soul food becomes really important. Um, and especially around this time where Jews, Southern Jews especially, become very, very strongly involved in the civil rights movement. Um, and a big part of Jewish involvement in the civil rights movement is actually delis. If anybody remembers this uh, image from our last class of the old time deli in, in Mississippi, deli at deli counters were some of the first civil rights sit-ins. Um, Jews and Jewish shop owners were some of the only um, shop owners who continued to serve Black folks during um, the upheaval, during the civil rights era. Um, and this is where you see, you know, again, right, our delis were these places where everyone was welcome, whether you're Jewish or not, and delis were some of the few places that consistently were open to folks of color um, throughout the 20th century. And so I think this is just a really interesting thing of like, Jews being involved in the civil rights movement, not just in terms of like actual activism, not just in terms of all the student sit-ins that occurred um, in, in Southern colleges and universities in which Jewish students were incredibly involved, um, but also you see it in actually the food spaces in which that Jews own, that Jews inhabit, that is open to everyone who's Jewish and not Jewish. Um, and they become really important locations for this exchange of identity, right? Um, another kind of 
strong image of Jewish identity. It's that classic image, right, of Abraham Joshua Heschel marching with Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, and I think that's the image that we see a lot, but it's also um, what we see in food, right? Like when we're talking about food, it's the deli as much as Abraham Joshua Heschel. Um, and so I kind of want to bring in this quote that I really love from Michael Twitty, who is a Black, gay, Jewish um, writer and food historian who I love. And he's done some really important work on bringing in the voices of Jews of color um, into the historic, the food history discourse. And so I'd love um, actually for someone to read this quote out loud to everybody. I certainly wouldn't mind. Yes, please, please go ahead. From the cooking gene by Michael Twitty, soul food or African-American heritage cooking in parentheses and its umbrella cuisine, Southern food, are the most remarked and most maligned of any regional or indigenous ethnic tradition in the United States. They are also big business and key to the aforementioned cultural tourism. Southern and soul foods are seen as unhealthy, self-destructive, and misguided, even as modern Southern chefs try to recast and reinvent the canon, emphasizing fresh ingredients, balance, and seasonality. And yet the arguments are not just about how much lard is too much. Um, the connection between heritage of both Southern and soul cuisines is hotly debated and arouses old racial stereotypes, prejudices, and cultural attitudes and intercultural misunderstandings. Great, thank you so much. I think we, we missed the last couple of words. Um, if you wanna reread them, the just and cultural attitudes. We go from, oh, I'll just read that whole line. Deba it's debated uh, and arouses old racial stereotypes, prejudices and cultural attitudes and intercultural misunderstandings. Right, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this is such a great quotation because I think part of it, right, is it highlights that when we're talking about soul food, we're not just talking about any sort of food. We're talking about a food that's kind of deeply laden with um, a certain racial and cultural identity, right? African-American heritage cooking, right? So when we use that in, in combination with Jewish, to get Jewish soul food, I think we get a very kind of um, complicated dance, right? Because the ethnic and racial kind of differences between Jews and African Americans, especially in the South, um, play upon, right? That old, those old racial stereotypes, those prejudices, the cultural attitudes. And in some cases you have Jews benefiting from this assimilated whiteness. You have, um, and you actually see it in, in the food. You see um, an increase in using foods like Jello and canned goods, right? assimilating into um, the kind of homemaker mid-century culture where canned and um, con modern convenient foods become this really important cornerstone of the kitchen. But then you also see on the other side, um, this real desire like um, for African-Americans in the South um, to maintain a really strong sense of identity um, that is enacted through food, right? Then that's how we see these very kind of warming, lovely Ashkenazi soul foods, that rice soup that, that comes up. Um, but also what I think is interesting about this quote that's highlighted here um, is this idea that, you know, Soul food's kind of bad for you, <laughs> no matter what. Um, I see Barbara, you're you're shaking your head, uh, <laughs> right? And and what you know, what like where does that charge come from, right? And I think what this quote brings up to me that's really interesting as well is like in modern Jewish food and modern Jewish cooking, we're seeing a revival that sort of parallels and is very much the same as what's happening with Southern food right now. That fresh ingredient, that seasonality, all of that, that kind of stuff. Recasting something that traditionally for various cultural reasons has been seen as a negative food, right? Like Ashkenazi food, 
um, has been looked down upon. African-American food has been looked down upon. Both have been labeled as bad for you or um, using smells or different um, seasonings that aren't good smelling or that connote a certain identity. Um, and here, here they are being recast in, in positive and exciting ways, despite those um, misunderstandings. Um, so that kind of brings me to like the third part of this idea of Jewish soul food that I think is really important. Um, and some of it is Jewish soul, but it's not exactly kosher soul, um, which is incidentally the, the name of the new book by Michael Twitty, um, which I highly recommend. Um, this quotation comes from his book, The Cooking Gene, which is a really awesome history um, of African-American food in the United States. Um, and he, as a Black gay Jewish man, um, is writing another book about his, his connection with Jewish identity and Jewish food specifically called Kosher Soul. Highly recommend it. Um, but so Jewish soul food now in the South um, looks very different and not all of it is kosher. Some of it looks like um, Alon Shia um, in New Orleans, his restaurant Shia putting Israeli foods on the table and bringing them into this culinary repertoire. Um, they also look like, you know, young chefs uh, like Chef Todd Ginsburg in Atlanta at the General Muir. I don't know if anybody's been to this, but the, the restaurant is actually named after the boat that the co-founder's grandmother arrived to the United States on in that wave of Ashkenazi um, migration. Um, and then you have places like Lucky's in uh, Durham, North Carolina, which unfortunately I think closed in the um, but there's a pastrami chili. Right, so it's like creative takes on different foods that include these different aspects of Jewish Southern um, flavor and culture and brings them um, into a plate together um, in new and inventive ways, right? And so I think there's this really interesting dance that's happening when we think about Jewish soul food of food that's, that's playing on all of these different um, kind of aspects of what it means to be Jewish and what it means to be Southern, right? So that Ashkenazi heritage, that Sephardic heritage, the strong, strong influence of African-American food on um, the Jewish culinary repertoire. Um, yeah, <laughs> yes, thanks Rabbi for tweeting Michael. His, his, he, we will be making his recipe today. Um, and I think that, that you know, is the kind of exciting thing that's bringing us to the, up to the present when we're thinking about Jewish food now and Southern Jewish food now, right? It's not just something that's in the past that's with our Sephardic colonial history. It's not just something that's with our Ashkenazi and Eastern European Jewish history, um, but really is something that's happening now and that young chefs are being inspired by despite the current um, decline of the Jewish community in the South. <coughs> Excuse me. So, and What's cool about this also is these are things that we can start to kind of bring into our own plates and our own modern Jewish traditions as well. And this is from Michael Twitty as well. And I think this is a fabulous kind of piece that you can actually use in your Passover Seder. Um, it is an African-American Seder plate because, right, I think as Jews, we are also beholden to this responsibility of not only freeing ourselves as once enslaved people, but like you know, honoring the history of those who have been enslaved. Um, and so what's also very cool about this from a, the perspective of Southern Jewish food is that you can actually kind of talk about this history with your Passover Seder with all of these ingredients and actually express them through food, right? With the sweet potato, the egg, hoe cake or ash cake, an orange, haroset, hot pepper, collards, right? We see, we keep seeing our collards kind of come through a wonderful addition to your Seder plate that brings into this conversation that complicated dance of racial and ethnic identity of Jews in the South historically with African Americans and how in a way kind of that that oppression that we've all experienced is intertwined deeply right um so I just wanted to share that I'm happy to also share this with you if you want to bring it into your your future Passover celebrations but 
I think it's also an interesting thing as we've been talking about Southern Jewish food and Southern Jewish soul food, especially, right? Whoever said holiday food, here it is. Again, bringing in that Jewish soul, that understanding of the holistic community who has created Southern food um, into our own enactment of our Jewishness. Cool. So with that, I have one more quote from Michael Twitty because I think we've brought up a couple of things here, right? There's soul food, there's Jewish soul food, there's kosher soul, and they all include these different communities, right? And different foods as well. So I'd love for someone to actually read this quotation as well. <coughs> Excuse me, something caught in my throat. Um, one, one last reader. I'll do it again if you want. Yeah, please go ahead. What is kosher soul and how does it differ from Southern Jewish food? Southern Jewish food created by non-Jewish black women is not the same as kosher soul food created by black Jews. For black Jews, <clears throat> it's more about making <clears throat> kosher, uh, it's all about making soul food kosher and eating things that are seasonally Appropriate. I think for Southern Jews, it was acclimating traditional Ashkenazi and Sephardi foods to the ingredients of the South, black eyed peas and kishka, fried chicken, but you use matzah meal, stuffed collard greens. Right. Thank you so much. Right. So again, we're, we're seeing kind of the different layers here, right? We have the influence of the strong signature, right, of non-Jewish Black women in Jewish kitchens throughout time. We really tangible marks on Jewish food. And I think we can think of that both in terms of the ingredients they brought in, but also, right, just the the mark of a non-Jewish person, which, you know, according to the rabbis in, in some cases is actually prohibited and makes something not kosher. But, you know, there's this, even if it's the same recipe, there's still an important influence there, an important presence that is not talked about a lot. I think, and that's a, an important part, right, of this Jewish soul food. Then we have Jewish soul food as kosher food, right, as kosher Southern food um, that looks Southern, but, you know, it's gumbo without the shrimp. It's, um, it's brisket, uh, barbecue brisket, right? And then there are, there's Southern Jewish soul food, which is the historic food of, of the communities we've been talking about. And this new kind of a very exciting, I think, wave of restaurateurs who are bringing their own takes um, of Southern Jewish food to bear, whether that's bringing in the flavors of Israel, whether that's bringing in a, de a new kind of deli to the South, whether that's kind of remixing, um, southern foods in in interesting ways um and then you know then you have people like michael twitty who are bringing really interesting combinations like black eyed peas and kishka fried chicken um you know stuffed collard greens all of these things that show that it's so easy and so interesting to express this identity through food um, and it's a really important part of the Jewish diaspora and the American Jewish diaspora that hasn't really been studied very much. So um, with that, I actually want to get us cooking. Um, and we're actually going to make one of Michael's recipes, a, a black eyed pea hummus, which I think is a really neat little um, kind of take on, on everything we've been talking about. Um, and we're also going to be making some sweet potato and apple latkes right in time for Hanukkah because we know that's coming up um, a little early this year <laughs> with Thanksgiving, um, which is also from Marcy Cohen Ferris's book. So um, with that, I'm going to transition us over. But before that, I just want to recommend a couple of books, a few books actually, um, for those who are interested in kind of exploring more of this uh, heritage through food. There's The Cooking Gene by Michael Twitty, um, High on the Hog, A Culinary Journey from Africa to America by Jessica B. Harris, um, and The Taste of Country Cooking, which is considered a classic by Edna Lewis, um, which are all really important 
cookbooks, not just on Jewish food, but on specifically the African-American um, culinary heritage in the South that has been, um, that is currently being uh, looked at more um, and honored more, but uh, for many years has kind of fallen to the wayside in terms of when we talk about Southern food, you know, who are we really talking about? So those are just some recommended readings. Um, <laughs> High on the hog is not kosher, <laughs> Judith. Thank you for that question. <laughs> um, delightful. Okay, with that, I'm going to transition us over so we can start making our hummus. Um, so here we go. Okay, so I'll bring you with me. Let's see where I can put you. Right here. Great. I'm going to put on my apron. Uh, here we go. Okay. Great. So, and again, as always, feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, I will try to keep track of them, but Margaret's going to be my question caller outer. So as I do stuff, if you um, don't <laughs> see me doing it, please, please let me know. Um, and today, so the recipes we're doing today um, reflect this kind of hybrid culture of Southern Jewish soul food, taking things that we kind of consider really Jewish, right? Hummus and latkes, two of the, the foods that we, and when we think about Jewish food, we're like, oh yeah, hummus and latkes, two very comforting things. Um, but they both use uh, ingredients that are specific to the South and very much indebted to the longstanding influence um, of African-American culture on the culinary heritage of the South. So, the first thing we're going to do is latkes. Um, and luckily, I have a, a food processor. If you don't, you could just use a grater. But um, using modern appliances uh, is always This is one of the few things where I will say use a, a, a modern appliance because it's just much easier. Um, so I'm putting the grating uh, function or grating blade on my food processor. And I'm just going to close it. And so, you know, normally our, our you know, classic Ashkenazi latkes are um, potato and onion. I'm trying to see. There we go. Are usually potato and onion, right? But these are a little bit sweeter because of the apple and because of the sweet potato. Um, and also differently, they're going to have a lot less starch. So they're going to, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to keep them together, but that's okay. I'll show you how I do that um, when we get started. So, okay. So first thing, I'm just going to cut off the ends of my sweet potato. Um, and I'm just going to peel these. And then I'm going to cut them into a manageable shape for my food processor. And you can leave the skin on with these, just like with normal latkes, you know, if you want, totally fine. Some of the interesting um, stuff actually I found in my research for this class was one of the, the main kind of points of shared heritage, culinary heritage of Southern food between Southern Jews and African Americans was the prevalence of fried foods. That was sort of noted a lot of, you know, the way that Jews generally eat a lot of latkes and other fried things, especially around Hanukkah, um, and the prevalence of using uh, oil to fry things um, in the soul food and African American um, repertoire was one of those things that, that kept coming up of like, oh, both of these communities do this. Sarah, I've got uh, two, two questions coming yeah. in. One, uh, one of our participants is hoping that you might be willing to share your email at the end to oh, stay yeah. in touch. Um, yeah, totally. Yes. And if you have questions, please, please send them my way. I love questions and I love, I love hearing from folks. So I'll be happy to do that. Yeah. And our second question is what is the difference between sweet potatoes and yams, which is a great question. That is a great question. Um, if I'm right, which I, I'm not sure I'm right, but I, what I have understood of it is that they're actually different tubers. They're different roots, right? Because potatoes are root vegetables. Um, and sweet potatoes are sweeter um, 
yams are starchier. <laughs> and I think yams are, I think they're both good for you, Judith. I think, I think, I think sweet potatoes and yams are okay. But um, just from a, a general principle of what they do in terms of cooking, um, in my experience, you have more starch with yams, um, which like for something like this actually would be great, right? Because some of what keeps the lot cooked together when you make it is that starch. It kind of binds, right? With the egg and the flour that we're adding or matzo meal. We're using matzo meal today as the binder. Um, and basically, essentially what a latka is, is it's a pancake that you fry um, of, and you can use like really any vegetable to make a latka. We just tend to use potatoes, right, out of tradition. Um, but if you're using a, a vegetable and or a fruit, um, like an apple and like a sweet potato, that neither of which have a lot of starch, um, you, we're gonna put in more egg and more matzo meal to bind them together so they don't kind of fall apart as we're frying them. Um, but instead of a sweet potato, a yam would be really good here to give a little extra starch to bind those latkes together. So um, in terms of that question, the, you know, if you wanna give it a try with yams and, um, and, and uh, try them in your latkes instead of these sweet potatoes, I highly recommend it. You might find that you actually get a, a latka that sticks together. Um, and I'm seeing Judith, your question, can it be done in a blender? I wouldn't. Um, if you don't have a food processor, I would actually recommend that you use a, a grater, a box grater here. I'll show you mine. If I can find it. I can't find it, but just your, your usual box grater on the, the biggest hole on your box you use instead of this processor. I'm just using this for convenience um, and it's very, very good and easy, but um, I have been in situations where I've made latkes um, by hand and it's just a little bit more elbow grease, but use your box grater um, with the biggest holes. Cool. And Sarah, we had another uh, question come in, which is a, a really interesting one. If you have any cookbooks that have inspired you that you could share, I know you've shared some with us already, but maybe there are some others that come to mind. Oh yeah. Well, I, for anyone who's interested in diasporic Jewish food, that's not just um, Ashkenazi and Sephardic food. I highly recommend the book of Jewish food um, by Claudia Rodin. Um, a source that I use a lot is actually the Encyclopedia of Jewish Food by Gil Marx, um, who actually unfortunately passed away a few years ago, but he's a phenomenal Jewish culinary researcher and he's a rabbi and a chef, or not a chef, but a, a, home, a very good home cook. Um, and he, he wrote the, the Encyclopedia and he's great. So highly recommend that. Um, one of my other favorite cookbooks is the Jerusalem cookbook by Yotam Odalenghi, for those of you who um, maybe know it. Uh, that is less, I think it, that one, you know, offers an interesting answer to this question of like, what is Jewish food? Um, but in a very different way, because it's not exactly Israeli, it's not exactly kosher, um, but it's very Jewish and it's very beautiful. And I love um, seeing Jewish food in interesting and new ways. So those are a couple that just immediately come to mind. Another one, which I love, I could go on forever with this. So feel free to stop me. But um, Cucina Ebreica by Joyce Goldstein. That's a classic. It's uh, Jewish Italian food, which is very, very good. Um, I'm going to pause myself here on these cookbook <laughs> recommendations quickly because I just want to show you what I'm doing. So I'm taking these sweet potatoes, hopefully you can see, and I'm just um, like, I'm having them uh, halfway longitudinally, I guess. This is, yeah, this is laterally, sorry. Laterally, and then I'm quartering them, right? So you should end up with um, eight pieces of sweet potato. Um, and this is important because as we blend these, I'm actually going to be mixing these with the apple in my food processor. And this is a way to ensure that you get an even distribution of sweet potato and apple throughout your latka. Um, I do this also with 
onions and just regular potatoes when I'm making latkes, just, you know, your classic potato latka. It's also good for those classic latkes because it will keep your potato from getting brown. That's less of an issue here. We don't need to worry about our potatoes getting gray or brown as, we're, as they're waiting um, because the sweet potatoes have less starch and the thing that actually makes those your potatoes gray is the starch that's released when you cut them. Um, but what it does here for us is that there's a very different moisture and cooking rate of our sweet potato to our apple here. And we wanna make sure that when we're making something that's a mixture of the two, we're getting an even or as even distribution as we possibly can of the two with each other so that our latkes all cook at the same rate, right? Because you don't want, you know, one latke that, that's really brown and what, the other that's really not brown. It has, um, an impact not only on the flavor, but the actual cooking time of your latka. Okay, so these are just three quite large sweet potatoes. So the recipe says three medium um, or like one and a half pounds of sweet potatoes. Um, I'm gonna see, you know, if I need another apple to that. And here you can use, so the recipe says a Granny Smith or a Honeycrisp. I chose Granny Smith because first of all, I like the tartness, right? And we're using a very sweet potato, um, but also honey crisps are not my favorite apple for cooking. They have a high amount of moisture in them, um, actually higher than Granny Smith. And so what that means is um, as it's cooking, it's gonna release that moisture. And instead of getting a really nice crisp latka, you get a kind of soft flat latka, um, which, is this kind of quality that you can play with that different sweet potatoes or different potatoes and different apples can give to your latka. So I just wanted to say that because that's something um, that's very important when we're making something even like the latka, which we think, oh, it's simple, it's easy, right? But there are these kind of little factors that are so important um, that really can affect the outcome of of the thing you make and also it's frying right because we're frying these in oil and moisture directly affects how things fry so more moisture means that when it hits the pan the oil is going to get colder it's going to delay the amount of time that it takes to fry that thing um, and that can mean a less less crispy um, outer surface right and the whole point of frying right is you want something crisp and yummy and delicious and calorie heavy, right? <laughs> um, that's something that I think um, is important to kind of take into consideration here. So all I'm doing here is I'm taking the, the core out of these apples. So I'm just quartering my apple and then I'm just taking the core out. I'm leaving the peel on. If you don't like the peel, you can um, get rid of it. But again, this is like an interesting kind of take, right? We've talked a lot about how one of the aspects of Jewish heritage in the kitchen is this desire to prevent as much waste as possible, right? And we see that again here. We're, we're using almost every part of this apple, including its skin. Um, and I think when we think about it from like the perspective of the African-American kitchen, of what was usually available to, to enslaved folks, to freed folks, um, traditionally wasn't a lot it wasn't all with very you know rare exceptions right there were exceptions but you have people trying to make do with the most of what they have um, and using kind of every aspect of it so um, I think that's an important thing if you're cooking from a historical angle um, right you could have kept these skins on I you know you can also bake these skins with so maple syrup, I would toss them with like oil, salt, pepper, maple syrup, and then you have something really delicious that you can have for later. Um, but I think it's important to kind of consider that like historical culinary repertoires um, were often made of, you know, from poverty and the need to like get as many nutrients as possible as with limited supply into your body.
right? And that's actually where fried foods and right that that idea that soul food is a bat is not nutritious or healthy or it has that kind of um, association of gluttony to it is really interesting because actually frying is a really effective way to get as many nutrients as densely packed into a piece of food as possible by embed, imbibing it with fat, right? Like imbuing every aspect of that piece of food with fat. So just a, a, a different take on, you know, a consideration that for many years stood about soul food, that it was bad for you, right? And I think it's important to kind of question that. Anyway, sorry, I'm going to interrupt myself. So what we're going to do is I'm going to start processing these potatoes and I'm going to do a couple of potatoes and I'm going to intersperse it with an apple. Okay. And again, just to get that nice mixture going. So it's going to be a little loud for a second. Um, pardon me, uh, but hopefully it will go quickly. Okay. My machine turns on. Okay, so I put in about four pieces of sweet potato, and now I'm going to put in one quarter of this apple. Just going to kind of split it up. And then I'm going to, I'm going to actually put in a little bit more apple. I think this could use a little bit more. And this is, of course, one of the things I did want to say as I was demoing this recipe um, to you all is that this is another great place to do some improv, right? Like this is your recipe. The recipe in a way is just a suggestion. Um, you have to follow it. So again, right, it's your journey. If you want more apple, like put more apple in, introduce that flavor. Um, I think, you know, one of my hopes for the recipes from this class is that they become a part of your culinary repertoire, your own Jewish culinary repertoire. And a big important aspect of that um, throughout time in any Jewish community, in any community really, is this idea of adapting it, of making it your own, of taking the flavors um, that are around you and bringing them into your kitchen. And as we see from this class, in some cases, that's through um, African-American women who are your domestic workers and then become your caterers and then, you know, have that um, connection to your community, or it's meeting people at the market, say, for example, in like medieval Spain, which is, in my research, a very common influence of how Jewish women brought new flavors into their home. Okay, so I'm going to put in um, a little bit more apple. But again, being conscious that as I add this apple, I'm also adding moisture. So I want to be very careful with that though. And Sarah, we've got a, a, a question coming in. Um, one is Judith is curious about what spices you, spices you would use. And then we also have um, Jane who's wondering, um, she has a cookbook from her sister in Kentucky that uses um, beef fat instead of lard and she's wondering about that flavor substitution also. Amazing, cool. Well, so I'm, I haven't introduced any spices here yet. There are no um, spices in these latkes. Though that being said, once we get to the mixing of them, that's a great place and I'll, I'll tell you when to add different spices that you can play around with that are very fun. Um, you can add some cinnamon because these are kind of a sweeter latke, right? You could add cardamom, you could punch up the spice, add a little ginger, um, that could be very good. Um, I think another thing, right, that comes up when we think about soul food generally is a, a set of flavors too, right? It's kind of sweet, it's savory and spicy, right? All at the same time, um, which is like a little different, right? Than if we're thinking about the historical Jewish repertoire, which, often has sour in it, but pickled things um, in the Sephardic tradition, lemons are really important, um, or like this very uh, specific uh, sour grape flavor becomes really important in the Sephardic tradition. Um, Jewish food often has a lot of sour and a lot of sweet in it. Um, so when we're thinking about, you know, 
right? Like mapping out cuisines through flavors, that's, that sour is kind of missing from soul food, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, but so that being said, this is something um, that is very kind of sweet and savory at once. It's got a sweet apple, a sweet potato. Um, and then you can, if you want, you can add sugar to it. You can add some spice to it. You can add um, some salt to kick up the savory aspect of it if you want to play up those flavors. And then you can choose spices that kind of play on them too, right? Like cinnamon, uh, cardamom again, I think would be great. I think you could add some nutmeg, uh, which is a traditional um, spice endemic to um, the United States that is that comes up a lot in African American cooking. So that could be like a fun play here too. So um, those are just some suggestions. And then the the beef <laughs> the beef fat instead of pork fat, I think is a really interesting question because when we're thinking about kosher soul food, right? Um, we often see Jewish recipes throughout time and place taking the same cooking technique of their non-Jewish neighbors, say with pork fat, which is a really great fat because when you render pork fat, pork fat has a really high smoking point. We're talking about oils. And actually, we're gonna talk a little bit more about smoke point in a second when we start frying. Pork fat's a really great thing. It, it's solid at room temperature. It has a really high smoking point, which means that you can heat it up really high, get things really hot and then fry them um, at a really high temperature for a long time, which makes things nice and crispy and, and all of that stuff. But if you don't have that available, you can do the same um, technique. You can apply the same technique to the meat and the fats that you do have, right? Which is beef. Um, and you get this very nice fat from beef as well. Although it's leaner, it, it doesn't, it's not as fat rich as pork fat. And so it also doesn't have as high What's interesting about that is it will add a different flavor. It will not have that unctuousness, I guess is the right word, as pork fat. Um, and it will also kind of change your cooking technique a little bit because you're using a fat that doesn't allow you to get to the same temperature, which I think is interesting. Most times when you see um, fried foods in the Jewish tradition, we're using oils like sunflower oil, vegetable oil, canola oil, vegetable-based oils that are parved, first of all, um, but also have a very, very high um, temperature. Oh, and of course, chicken fat, right? Griminous, <laughs> the, that classic rendered chicken fat. Um, is really um, great as well. Um, again, it has a slightly lower smoke point. And this is not something that, you know, historic Jewish communities are thinking about a smoke point, but it is something that you learn through the applied use um, and, and practice in the kitchen, right? Cool. So I'm going to pause myself on that. And we're going to actually come back to smoking points later when we start frying. Um, and I'm going to continue to process uh, our sweet potatoes. So again, I don't know if you can hear me. I hope you can hear me. I'm doing a few sweet potatoes and then I'm going to add an apple. Okay, and then we're going to add an apple. Okay, and then one of the things that I like to do when I'm making latkes and, and you know, making this mix, like we see we've got all of this nice apple and sweet potato mixed up, I actually like taking my bowl, take over here. You are? Okay. So I like taking my bowl and I'll just pour out this mix into my bowl. And then I'm actually going to take my hands and just make sure that everybody's sort of evenly distributed, right? Because again, we want to make sure that we're imbuing our latkes with all of these different qualities when we mix different things, when we mix different types of potatoes and different types of legumes, different apples right in here. And we want to make sure that that's consistent throughout all of the patties that we make. So 
the best tools for the job here are really your hands um, to make sure that, look, you get that nice even distribution of apple and sweet potato. And again, it's your party. You can use different types of apples. You could use, you know, a, I would recommend that you use a baking apple, which is generally an apple that has a lower moisture content um, and tends to be tartar um, because it will become sweeter while you bake it, but also it will control the amount of moisture that's in your latka, again, which affects the, the actual frying of the latka. Um, but you can, you can use sweeter apples if you like. Um, generally, sweeter apples also have higher moisture content, so that's just something to be aware of. Um, if you like something sweet, you know, use a Honeycrisp, use a Red Delicious, use um, a Macintosh would be very good. If you want something that's a little bit more like a traditional baking apple, you can use a Granny Smith, an Empire, a Cortland is great here. Um, you can try the Honeycrisp. I don't love them. They're not my favorite. So I would, I would recommend that you use a, um, a, a Granny Smith, but it's your party. Again, it's your latka. Um, and I think historically, when we're thinking about those apples too, those drier, kind of hardier, more sour apples. Yeah, I see my, my camera's flipped for some reason. There we go. Um, were also the apples that were more readily available to folks who were on the lower socioeconomic spectrum, right? They're the less good apples. So <laughs> quote unquote, bad apples, right? Like that's where we get the term. So, okay, so I'm gonna keep, keep going here. Um, do we have any questions in the chat, Margaret, that I should be aware of? No, no questions yet, but we do have a great suggestion from Suzanne. Um, she recommends the Kosher Creole Cookbook, um, which I've seen and, and is a really great cookbook. So thanks for the suggestion, Suzanne. Cool, thank you. So now I'm gonna put in some apples. Right. And what's great about this also is, right, apples turn brown. They're not gonna turn brown as we mix them in because they're mixing with, um, with the uh, sweet potato in here. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing something in the chat about Honeycrisp. Um, and yeah, Honeycrisp are, are recent genetic, genetically modified apples. So. They, they taste very good. They, they were actually not genetically selected to bake well, which is again, another reason why I would not recommend them for this recipe. Okay. So here we, we're making our way through our sweet potatoes, almost done. Um, uh, one more apple. Okay, and then we're gonna put this in our bowl again. And these big pieces that kind of get caught at the top, those can go right in the bowl too. Again, we're not wasting anything here, um, both because of the influence of our African-American kitchen, our soul food kitchen, and our Jewish soul food kitchen, right? Of, of Ashkenazi and Sephardic chefs, um, Jewish chefs throughout time. We use every scrap of the thing that they were making. Okay, great. So here we are, I'm gonna mix these with my hands again. Um, to make sure that we get these nice chunks of apple and sweet potato fully distributed throughout this bowl. Um, and this is another place where I like to say, right, like historically, like your hands are your best tools here. So um, use them. This is a great recipe to use your hands with. Um, and they will more reliably tell you, I think, than a spoon whether all of this stuff is nicely mixed in together. Okay, so just gonna clean this off. And here is the moment we're just gonna mix in all of the stuff that binds this together. So I'm gonna put in four eggs right in here. 
And Sarah, did you peel the apples? I did not peel the apples. So I use everything and you can, you can, um, I peeled the sweet potato, um, but you can leave the peel on. It's your, it's your choice. Again, um, I think the peel adds like a little bit of rusticness. It doesn't, it's not going to hugely affect the flavor. Um, I know that there are folks among us who might have kids or have kids in their lives who don't like the peel of the potato. You can totally get rid of it. Um, or the peel of the apple also you can get rid of it. Um, keeping the peel on the apple actually helps it not brown as well. So that's just a helpful thing. If you're worried about the aesthetics of your latkes, um, you can keep that peel on. But I, I kept it on sort of in an homage to um, how the Jewish kitchen kind of uses up every aspect. Um, in its cooking, and uh, I suggest you do too because it adds flavor and reduces waste. So, okay, so I've got four eggs in there, and then I'm going to put in matzo meal. And I believe it's three quarters of a cup, but we're going to just kind of see and feel it out because, especially with latkes. Um, you can have a recipe that says, you know, X amount of eggs, X amount of matzo meal, um, but the actual binding kind of depends on how much moisture is in the potatoes you're using or any other food um, that you're, you, or any other vegetable or legume that you've added to this mixture. Um, so I'm gonna just start a quarter cup at a time adding matzo meal to this mixture. And I'm actually gonna use my hands to get a sense of it coming together. We want something that holds together, but that we don't have to pack tightly because if we pack it tightly, we're going to get a very thick, very dense latka. Um, and nobody really likes that. So I'm going to just kind of this over. I'm going to start with half a cup here, especially because I haven't used all of my potatoes. And where did this one go? use the salt. And we're really going to put in a nice pinch here because we have such sweet um, ingredients in these latkes. Take off my rings. And I'm just going to put my hand in here and mix this all together. Um, oh, you want to see this a little bit better. Is that better? You can see the bowl. Okay. I'm just going to put my hand in here. I've got my four eggs. If you want, as in last classes, you can break these into a bowl before you mix them in and check for blood spots or, um, you know, just make sure that they are good eggs. Uh, we had a really interesting conversation about that afterward, actually, um, with Rabbi about how her mother always uh, looked at the eggs. Um, and we kind of had this thought of like, oh, maybe it's because you know, there's, it's a kitchen where you don't want to waste anything. And if you put in an egg in your mixture, that's not very good. Then you have to throw out the whole thing, which was a really interesting thought that I, I wanted to share. So I'm just going to get my hands in here and mix this all up. And you just want to make sure that everything kind of has a little bit of egg. It has a little bit of matzo meal. Um, and again, this is a great area to add spices. And this is some of the cool stuff that's happening right now. And I, what I would call like sort of the Jewish food revival in the South in you know, these restaurants like the General Muir and, um, and Shia, where these Jewish chefs are kind of enacting their Jewish identity through the food that they make at their restaurant. And they're using the fresh and seasonal flavors of the area where they are to inform, you know, how they're making Jewish food. And so you can have things like latkes, sweet potato and apple latkes with cinnamon and cardamom and, and things that are, that we now kind of acknowledge as part of the Jewish um, uh, culinary repertoire. So I'm gonna give this a try to see if I've added enough matzo meal. And of course you can use flour instead of matzo meal, like if you don't have matzo meal around. Um, 
Another interesting thing to do with this, instead of just making latkes, is you can actually turn it out into a pan, the same exact mixture, into a casserole pan and bake it, and you will have a kugel. So you can make like a sweet potato and apple kugel, which would be very good. But I'm going to give this a press and see if it kind of holds together. And it does. It's a little, it's a little bit loose. So I'm going to add a little bit more matzo meal. And Sarah, do you ever use a potato starch? That was a question that came in. I love the kugel idea, by the way. Oh, and now Lenore is also asking what varieties of apple you use. Right? I think we did touch on a little, but you can refresh. Yeah, that. totally. So um, I don't usually use potato starch, but you can totally reasonably use it here. Um, some other things that are, you know, good thickeners and binders, right? The role that the matzo meal is playing here is as a binder. It's helping keep these disparate pieces of potato and apple together. Um, you can use anything kind of that adds that starch. So potato starch here would probably be great, right? Especially because as I was saying with the sweet potato, we're missing um, that starch that we would normally get from like a normal run of the mill potato. Um, different potatoes have different levels of starch, right? So that, that comes out in the liquid that's produced when you grate them. And that can give your latka like different qualities and enable it to bind together differently. So, you know, if you're using something that's very low on starch, like this recipe has a lot of matzo meal in it um, relative to the recipe that I make say with just normal latkes. So you can use something about like a potato starch that does have a really high starch content. You can use arrowroot starch, which is a, another kind of great um, substitute that is also particular to southern cooking, arrowroot um, is an important vegetable, um, especially in the indigenous kitchen. Um, you can also use rice flour is very good. It's low in gluten, um, but high in starch, um, which is helpful. It's a good binder. Um, yeah, those are kind of different suggestions for different types of, of matzo meal um, and things like uh, things like uh, arrowroot starch are great uh, if you have someone in your life who's gluten-free and you want to make them a latka because it's gluten-free. You can also use cornstarch. Great. Yeah, Cindy, I see that in the chat. I'm going to wash my, oh, well, first, I'm going to just make sure this is sticking together much more nicely. I don't know if you can kind of tell, but this really is nicely holding together. Like when I flip it, it doesn't need a lot of support to kind of stay together, which is how I know that this latka is ready to go. One of the things that I also like to do, I know that there's already egg on this, but I'm just gonna take one piece of potato. And I'm gonna eat it and I'm gonna check for salt. And this needs just a touch more salt. So I'm gonna add a little more salt to it. Um, and again, this is not in the recipe, but if you want, this is a great time to add um, so flavoring here, like I'm going to add a little bit of cinnamon just to give it a little sweetness. Um, I love the use of cinnamon and things that are flavor or that are savory. Oh yeah. And scallions. We've got scallions in here too. I almost forgot. So I'm going to add some, just a couple of scallions, very thinly sliced to this mixture. Um, and often people will say just to use the, the light, the white part and the light green parts of the scallion, which you can do here too. Um, I'm going to save these tops um, and they're great garnish. You can thinly slice them and then just sprinkle them over the top of your vodka. Um, But again, like you could, instead of scallions, if you don't like scallions, you can add parsley. You can add, I think cilantro would be delicious here. Not very traditional um, with this recipe, but just it adds a different, a different flavor um, and something kind of nice to your vodka. And Sarah, have you ever tried curry powder before? That was a suggestion from Barbara. I haven't, but I think that would be delicious. Like I think I think this is a really great canvas for you to kind of use different flavors. Like I love using curry powder. Like actually I roast um, cauliflower with curry powder and a little bit of cayenne pepper, olive oil, salt, pepper, 
and maple syrup, right? So you've got a little spiciness, a little sweetness, and that's really, really delicious. And I think that could work here as well. Um, kind of using warming spices, I think would be lovely with this mixture. Okay, so here we are. And I'm just gonna let that sit and hang out because right now we are going to start heating up our oil. I've got a cast iron on my stove. And Sarah, one question that actually came a little bit ago and I was thinking you're probably gonna get to it is um, what temperature that you wanna get the oil to? So maybe you're gonna touch on that. Uh, yes. Leonard is curious. Exactly, exactly. Well, actually I don't have an exact temperature that I fry at. I'm sort of one of those uh, old school chefs that um, I will tell you when I think you should fry in it and when it's ready rather than relying on a thermometer because that can really sometimes you don't have a thermometer, right? Like first of all, sometimes it's not available. Um, but I also think having the skill of being able to tell when something's ready to use for frying is really useful. Um, and so I'm gonna talk you through actually how to do that without relying on a thermometer. I do have a thermometer though, so I can take the temperature um, <laughs> and I'll let you know what the temperature I'm frying at is so that you have it. But um, I'm, I'm a little old school and I don't actually keep track of it. <laughs> so it's a good question. I see in the chat adding raisins or craisins. Yeah, that sounds great. That would be delicious. Like if you're thinking about it sort of as like a, a sweet potato cocoa, right? Add, add things that you would add to a cocoa to this mix and, and throw it in, give it a try. I feel like that would be delicious. Maybe take out the scallions if you're using raisins. So I'm going to add actually just a add a little bit more salt and there we are and so right now what's happening I'm just gonna bring you over to show you hopefully you can kind of see so I've just got a, a cast iron here and it's got about a half inch of vegetable oil here in the bottom of my pan um, and what I'm doing is I'm actually heating this up on a medium low heat so um, under the center point of the dial on my stove. And why am I doing that? Because when you're frying, you want to hit a high temperature, but you don't want to hit the smoke point, right, of the, the fat that you're frying in. So what is the smoke point again? It is the temperature at which your fat smokes. And why is that important? Because once it starts smoking, you can't fry in it. It's compromised the structure of the fat um, to make it so that you can't Actually, you can cook with it, but it's going to add um, some not so nice qualities to your thing that you're making, such as a burnt flavor, right? Which is not what we're going for when we fry things. We want something nice, even brown, crunchy, delicious. Great. So what are we going to do? One of the ways to kind of control um, the heat of your oil is to heat it up slowly but steadily. So I'm using a consistent medium low temperature to heat up my oil so that it will get hot but I can control it and I can fry with it longer right we're kind of using the vitality of cooks who didn't have an abundance of oil available to them as they were cooking so you you want to make sure that you're not hitting that smoke point you're not burning out your oil before you've finished frying all of the stuff you need to fry in it, right? And that actually means that in some cases, after you've fried um, things in oil, you can actually save that oil and use it again, right? And so you get these kind of, this cookery that's characterized by different qualities of oil, um, different, using different uh, oils that have been used already or not used already for, you know, better things, you know, the, the things that you're serving to company are in the oil that you haven't used yet, but maybe the, the stuff that you fry for yourself and for your family, you're using that day old oil, that two day old oil that's already fried something. Okay, so we kind of preserve that by um, heating it up in a very kind of measured way. And there are a couple of ways you can tell if your oil is ready to fry. So one of the things is it starts to shimmer. Uh oh, Sarah, I think that we you cut out a little bit. You're frozen on your uh, screen. The audio is coming through.
see my Hold tight, everyone. It's not a Zoom program if someone doesn't freeze for a minute. I see it move. It's a little. Sarah, can you uh, can you hear me? Oh. Okay, everyone, hold tight. I think that she sees that we've lost her. Hey, Sarah, can you hear us? I don't think she has a microphone on that camera that's over the food, so she won't be able to respond to you. I was I was muted. I'm sorry. There we're she having, is. We're having some technical difficulties, but you can hear me talking, right? Yes, we can hear okay, you. Great. So I'm just going to use this camera. I'm sorry about that. I'm not quite sure what happened. Um, my computer just decided to give up conveniently, right? Um, so I'm, again, right, we're heating up our oil on a consistently low heat here, right? So there are a couple of ways, as I was saying, to, um, to tell if your oil is ready. First of all, it starts to shimmer. What does shimmer mean? Well, it, right, mm -hmm. it's shiny, but that's hard to see um, when we're using a cast iron pan, right? Like we can't really see if anything's shining. What you can you see though, and another kind of meaning of shimmering in a culinary sense with oil is if it starts to kind of move around. And that's a little bit hard, I think, for you guys to see on my camera, but um, you can kind of vaguely see it that the oil like kind of inside itself starts to kind of ripple. Um, and that's how you know it's, it's getting ready to fry it. Another trick that you wanna be very careful with, but is also very effective is you just take a little bit of water and you just put a drop in and see if it starts kind of popping. So I'm gonna do that again so maybe you can hear it. Maybe you hear that popping, right? We hear a pop. Here, I'm gonna actually turn off the audio. Sorry, everybody. I'm having a real, real, real. Yeah, we're getting a little feedback, unfortunately. Is this better now? Yes. Okay, great. Awesome. Sorry about that. I'm not sure what's happening with my technology. Okay, so we're it's popping. So that's one way we can tell. Another way is we have this whole bowl of of um, latka <laughs> latka um, potatoes and stuff ready to go. So. You can just put one of those threads of potato in there and it immediately starts to fry. And that's how we know, okay, we're ready to go. So I'm just going to take about a quarter cup size and in my hands, I'm just kind of smushing it together. Not so much that it is a ball, but just enough that it, it vaguely holds together. And I'm just going to drop it into my oil. And I'm just going to do this until my pan is full. And when we're using something like sweet potato, again, it's le there's, less, there's less starch here. So it's gonna, you might get a couple of pieces of potato that fall off, that's okay, those are still good. And you might wanna kind of squish them down in the pan just to kind of cohere it together. Okay, and there's four. So we don't wanna crowd our pan. We also don't wanna too tightly bind our latkes together. We just wanna give them enough of a push that they just kind of hold, but not so much that we're squishing them down and compressing them, because that's also gonna mean that when we, even though the outsides of those latkes are cooked, the insides won't be. And we don't really want that. We want a fully cooked, evenly cooked latka, right? So we're just gonna like let these chill out in this pan and, at a medium low heat, they're just gonna do their thing. And then in about four-ish minutes, we're gonna flip them, okay? And in the meantime, um, I wanna get us prepped so that we can do recipe number two. So with that, just gonna rinse out my food processor bowl very quick. Um, and this is a good time, Margaret, if there are questions for me, I'm happy to answer. 
We, we've got a couple of comments coming through. We definitely have some experienced latka fryers, ideas ranging from breadcrumbs to the end of a wooden spoon for testing oil. Um, one question that did come through or, or a conversation was around adding nuts potentially. Oh. So I think that was sort of an add-on of the dried fruit conversation. Have you ever put nuts in them before? I haven't, but you can, you definitely can. I think also like an interesting um, thickener might be a nut flour instead of um, a uh, like arrowroot or potato starch or just flour flour that like you can also use nut flours as thickeners again they don't have starch but they can uh, they will interact with an egg sort of similarly to flour um, which is nice. Yeah. Um, Seems like yeah. it'd be a great flavor too and then the only other comment we have so far although if anyone has a question feel free to to throw it in is uh, Jane suggests serving them with creme fraiche which sounds really good to me. Yes. That sounds divine. I love that. Or, you know, if you really want to get uh, sort of Ashkenazi with it, you could add sour cream. I love um, sour cream. And that's a that's a lovely thing. You can also just use Greek yogurt. Um, those who are dairy free, you can also um, use some coconut yogurt, like full fat coconut yogurt. Jesus. How many times? Oh, I think we got... Oh, and I think we have one more question coming in. I know that you've been asked this a few times, but maybe one more note on a variety of apples that you used this particular time, if you can remind us. Yeah, so for this, for today, I use Granny Smith, which I generally like in any, in any capacity where an apple is being cooked, I like a Granny Smith. That's it. Oh, and I'm just going to ask that um, you go ahead and mute if you are not. I'm trying to find you, but I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Okay. So we're getting set up here um, for our black eyed pea hummus. But before that, I'm just going to flip these or check them out if they're ready to be flipped. Kind of what I love about frying food. Um, and again, I'm a, I'm a person, I don't really love using um, thermometers and, and kitchen equipment if I don't have to, because I think when you're really paying attention to what you're making, it gives you a lot of information about, you know, how to replicate it uh, in different circumstances, right? Like, because like in high altitude situations, right? Like water boils, for example, at a different temperature, like oil gets hot at a different temperature. So those things aren't necessarily consistent, but what are, what is consistent is the kind of physical properties we're seeing. So one of the things that I love about fried foods is they kind of tell you when they're done and they're ready to be flipped. And how do they do that? They kind of let go. And that was pretty easy to, to, to see like that, that bottom of that waka kind of already let go and it's getting brown. That's kind of my test guy he could go for a little longer. So I think we want maybe another four minutes on each side. Um, and you might find that like with my stove, you have hot spots and cool spots. So, you know, as you're frying, move your pan around and make sure that you're like we did, right? With our apple and potato mixture, we're getting an even distribution of heat as well as an even distribution of apple and potato and, and all of that stuff. Okay. Great. Another got, topic here. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, we've got a great exchange going on in the chat about how to get rid of the smell of frying latkes. Yeah. One suggestion was to cook cabbage, which I thought was great. And then we also had someone chime in, uh, what's, what's wrong with the smell of frying? So, oh, and a light spritzing of vinegar and water into the air. I don't know if you have any suggestions. Certainly the smell of frying latkes can linger. I don't, I don't. I just kind of let it happen. Um, my mom actually and in our house at, at home, she will um, actually take the pillows from her bedroom and shut them in her bathroom because there's no door between her bedroom and our kitchen. Uh, so the, the smell of frying always gets into their bedding. So her strategy has always been to kind of make a prison for her blankets in the bathroom. So you could also do that as well. Um, I have less creative solutions to that. I just kind of go with it. So, okay, we're going to just see how our luck is. I haven't doing. chimed in at all. It's Rabbi Emily. 
Hi, Rabbi. How are you? I'm great. I just wanted to say that uh, something came up before that, um, that I just wanted to make a suggestion about something for the topping with this. It's not at all Southern, but I think it would be great. And it's something that someone made for me, oh, about 20 years ago to go with a, a sweet potato locker like this. Yeah, what You're was ready? it? Yeah. Mango chutney. Ooh, delicious. So it might not be Southern, maybe that's Southern India, but anyway, it could be a nice way to, to bring in something else. So uh, just know I'm enjoying it and I can smell the, the frying oil all the way from Minnesota to North Carolina. I love it. I love it. Thanks, Rabbi. Well, and thank you for that suggestion. That's great. Also to the, to the person who asked me about curry powder in these latkes, that would be a great doing a curry powder in the latkes and then doing a mango chutney on top. That would be delicious. Um, so thank you. Good to hear your voice, Rabbi. Um, cool. So, okay, let's switch gears. We're making a little mayhem here on my kitchen counter, but that's okay. All right. We're going to switch gears to our hummus, right? So, okay. So let's see if I can get some, some of these scraps out of the way so you can kind of see. Okay. So in our food processor, I've got, um, a can of black eyed peas that I have drained. And so this for me is like another one of these recipes that is just like this amazing summation of, of, of Jewish soul food um, in that it plays on an ingredient that is important both um, in the Jewish tradition, specifically the Sephardic Jewish tradition and the African American culinary tradition. Um, so I think it's really special. It's a black eyed pea. Um, Maybe you know this, but um, in the Sephardic tradition every year um, on Rosh Hashanah, Sephardic Jews um, in most homes, in some homes, not everyone does this, of course, um, do a Rosh Hashanah Seder. And what is it? They take um, certain ingredients that are symbolic. They say a prayer over it called a Yehid Atzon, like may it be God's will, right, the, in this year to bring in these blessings for our year, right, like as we do. Um, the cool thing about black eyed peas is that it actually comes from the heritage of Sephardic Jews settling in the new world. And again, it kind of brings us back to that point, right, of like the interesting and complicated relationship between Jews and, and African American, African communities um, throughout time, uh, where we both have this ingredient that's really important. Um, in different ways. And actually in um, African-American homes, black eyed peas are seen as a, a, a symbol of wealth, um, similarly to the Sephardic tradition. And they are eaten on the new year in, in January. Um, and it's eaten in the Sephardic home uh, in September, October on Rosh Hashanah. So it's a, an interesting thing kind of tying us together, um, but also speaks to a sort of complicated past because um, some Sephardic families learned about these through enslaved peoples who, who brought them with them from their homeland. So um, food, food tells a lot of stories. Um, okay, and so I've just taken a can of black eyed peas that I got at the store, 15 ounce can, I drained it, I rinsed it because there's always that kind of residual um, starch on the beans. And I'm just gonna take four garlic cloves that uh, smashing sound you heard was my was the heel of my hand smashing the garlic, which helps remove the skin more easily. And I'm just gonna throw four cloves of garlic in here. So that's one. Um, I have really big cloves of garlic, so I'm actually just gonna use three, but this is your journey. You can add as much or as little garlic as you want in here. We've got a great suggestion from our rabbi also, or question slash suggestion, which is, yeah. you know, is there a specific black eyed pea song we should listen to while cooking or eating this from the, oh, it's the band the black eyed peas for those who aren't familiar? I love that. I love that. Probably, probably uh, let's get it started, rabbi, right? Because we're, we're having a party. What? You know, that's what, that's what Virginia said, but is that the one where they say Mazel Tov and L'chaim in it? Because there is a Black Eyed Peas song with oh, L'chaim. Oh, yeah. Um, no, that's, uh, that is. that's another one. I'm forgetting the name, but that would also be a great one to use okay. here. I want to make sure we that. have 
I just want to make sure we have our soundtrack. That that's normally my job is thinking of the soundtrack to go with the food, but okay. I love it. We'll make a Spotify playlist for this episode. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, <laughs> I love it. Cool. Okay. So I'm just going to quickly pulse this. I've got my garlic cloves and my black eyed peas in here. And while the recipe says to do this all together, um, I find that with something like a hummus, it's actually really good to kind of do it in stages. So you make sure that the consistency is exactly what you want. So, okay. So I'm going to just start pulsing this. I'm sorry. It's going to be loud for a second. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here. This is again, you know, this recipe is a suggestion. Like you can live out your own black eyed pea hummus journey here. Um, and you don't have to grind this as, as smoothly as I am. I like a smoother hummus. If you want it a little chunky, you can stop here and call it a day and that's great. If you want to keep processing it like me, feel free. So I'm gonna keep processing it. Okay, and I'm looking for a mostly smooth paste. It's gonna continue to smooth as we add liquid to it. Um, but I just kinda wanna take the top off and show you that it's already like a paste that kind of sticks together. And that's sort of the consistency we're looking for. If you are kind of garlic averse or um, you have people who have garlic sensitivities but you still wanna use garlic in this recipe, um, you can actually process the garlic first and mince it up very fine and then add that black eyed peas. And that way the garlic will be more evenly dispersed throughout. Um, just a suggestion, sometimes when we add garlic already to a mixture um, that, or to other things in a food processor, it doesn't get ground as finely. Um, that doesn't bother me, for example, but like uh, for my dad, for example, who's sensitive to garlic, that's, that's something that I like to watch out for for him. So, okay. So, and then I'm gonna take, I've got tahini, and this is like a very neat, I think, play with this like new Middle Eastern Israeli restaurant culture that's coming in some ways to define what the current uh, Jewish South kind of looks like in terms of food, is we're making, we're basically making a hummus, but instead of um, chickpeas, we're just using black eyed peas. And so I like a lot of tahini. So I'm just going to put in a hefty third of a cup of tahini in here. Um, and tahini is wonderful because it adds like a really beautiful, like nuttiness. Um, it's slightly bitter, which is good because, uh, black eyed peas also when they're cooked have sweetness. They're, they're like a high, high starch, high sugar bean or really pea. Um, and so the, the tahini adds a welcome bitterness. Some interesting substitutions here might be like actually using peanut butter um, and playing on the, the heritage of the peanut in the South, um, which could be cool um, if you're really going for it. Um, it's not in this recipe, but you could give it a try. Tell me how it is. And then I'm gonna put in the juice of a lemon. You can, this is, this is where I'm gonna go a little off script. The recipe, the recipe says about a third of a cup of lemon juice. You can do a third of a cup of lemon juice. You can do less, you can do more. It's, it's your taste here. So you can do less tahini, you can do more tahini. Um, so, so really feel free to kind of live your, your journey and, and live your best hummus life and do what feels right to you. And then I'm gonna blend this again, I'm gonna, Instead of just doing it all at once, I'm gonna give it a nice pulse. Okay, and I'm gonna show you what it looks like. So we see it's a pretty thick paste. That's kind of, you know, it's not, everybody's not fully mixed in, but we've got some nice, nice thick tahini black eyed pea mixture happening. And actually what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna add in those spices. And I'm gonna add the olive oil last because we're gonna see what happens to this hummus as we add the olive oil. So I'm gonna add just some parsley that I have here. Just can go straight in. Okay. 
The recipe also calls for, I think it's about a, tea, a teaspoon of smoked paprika. So I'm just kind of eyeballing that. That's about a teaspoon. I'm gonna add a half teaspoon of cumin, right? Our, our little trick, right? That's a half teaspoon. And then I'm gonna add a teaspoon of chili powder. I'm actually using Aleppo chili, which is a really delicious um, type of chili that comes from the Middle East. I'm gonna add pepper, because why not? Add a nice pinch of salt, because we need that salt. And then the, this recipe calls for two things that I think make it particularly Southern, which is a teaspoon of brown sugar, which I'm just gonna kind of sprinkle in. And you can, you can leave it out. You can add more, however you want, make a slightly sweeter hummus. Um, and then it also calls for hot sauce. I don't have hot sauce, but I have a little bit of this um, garlic chili paste that I'm just gonna use a little bit of just to get a little heat. Just a little bit, you know? Okay, great. And that's of course, like if you don't like spicy foods, don't put it in. <laughs> if you do, add more. It's, it's your journey. Okay, so I'm gonna give it a nice pulse. get this nicely blended. And we see it's already kind of really looking like a smooth and creamy hummus, which is great, um, but it's very thick, right? And so what do we need to do? We're gonna add a little bit of liquid to kind of lighten it and make it really fluffy and beautiful. Um, and it's one of my favorite things about making hummus is this part, we're gonna, it, we're literally making an emulsion here. So we're adding air and fat and it's gonna kind of expand the volume of the hummus that we're making and also lighten its color. So that was about a third of a cup of olive oil. And I'm just give it one more pulse. And then we have this really beautiful, very light hummus. And I'm just gonna, I'm flipping our latkes to make sure that they're browning, which they are, although some faster than others. But, okay, one of the things I wanted to show you is one of the ways to actually serve this hummus that I think is really beautiful. I'm just gonna pour it out into a bowl that I have here prepared. And Sarah, we've got a, a question that's a good one, which is, you know, are the canned black eyed peas as good as using fresh or dried ones? Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I love to just make the beans myself and, and there are great ways of introducing flavor, right? You can uh, boil them with like more garlic, with an onion and, and really imbue them with flavor. So I'm always going to opt for doing it the longer way. Um, but if you can't find them in your grocery store in a can, uh, or if, if you can't find them dried, which has happened to me before, then you can use the canned ones in a pinch and that's great. Okay, so yeah, so it's, it's your journey. You can feel free to use the canned ones and it won't be terrible at all by any means. I think I believe in, in the quality of, of canned beans, but um, if you want more control over the flavor of what you're making, um, I recommend getting dried and making them yourself. Okay, so very quickly, I just wanna show you just one of the ways that you can serve this, which I think is really pretty. We're just gonna kind of smooth this out in the bowl and just kind of make a well just by turning the bowl around, right? So we've got this nice well. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a little bit of oil and just pour a little oil over the top because I think that looks nice, right? We've got some nice oil here. Um, and I'm going to take a little bit more of this, the spices that we actually used to flavor it. And I'm just going to kind of sprinkle them over the top 
here just for a little extra color and a little extra flavor. And one of the things that I like to do, here we're gonna add like a little parsley, just as a, like a garnish, right? Inspired by those restaurants that we're seeing pop up in the South. And just, I like to add another little sprinkle of salt because it will mean that whenever we get that bite, it will, will have a nice little, you know, piece of salt in it. So that's like just a little lovely way of, of serving it if you have company. Um, and that's very nice. Okay, we've got to go back very quickly. I know we're right at time, but we got to go back very quickly to our latkes, which are have been in the pan. They're getting brown, getting nice and crispy. I'm actually going to take a plate with a paper towel, um, and I'm going to put my latkes on that plate just to get rid of any excess oil. And we just want to see, okay. We've got a nice, evenly brown latka. There they are. And adding to the latka toppings, you can of course even serve this with your black eyed pea hummus and that might be a very nice accompaniment. So we've got some latkas that, I've got a little bit of a cold spot on my pan, so I'm just gonna, let them keep going so they get nice and even. And I'm gonna add a little bit more latka batter to my pan. There we go. So I'm just, again, like lightly pressing them into the pan with my fingers very carefully, avoiding the hot oil. Just making sure they get nice and even and brown. And so, okay, so here they are. We've got our beautiful apple and sweet potato latkes and our beautiful black eyed pea hummus, um, both inspired by this interesting complicated history of Jewish and African American um, interaction through food and with food and around food um, in the South. And our last two recipes of this really awesome series that we've had together. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you. Um, feel free to stick around and ask me questions if you have any. Um, but I just want to say another huge thank you to Sage for having me. Um, and a huge thank you to all of you for, for joining me for this series. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and I hope it's opened up um, some extra exciting doors for you of your own culinary exploration um, and exploration of, of Jewish food in the South. So thank you all so much. Um, it was